streets. <laughs> All right, so now we're on the web. Okay. Yo, less than a minute to air. Hi, this is Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream. This is the launch of the beta version of our site right here on Al Jazeera's website. We need your help because in two weeks, we're going to start broadcasting live on our global television network, Al Jazeera English, and we're going to need your input to make it right. The stream will be something new and unique, a social media community with its own daily TV program. We'll bring you stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, we'll be looking at a Yemeni vlogger who goes home to find a different picture than the one portrayed on TV. A 72-year-old grandfather who takes on corruption in the world's largest democracy with the help of millions of tweets. And how Mexicans are using social media to end the violence their government cannot. <laughs> 2011 is already the year social media changed the world. Events in North Africa and the Middle East have shown how individuals are now driving the news. On the stream, we want you to help us find Facebook posts, videos, photos, tweets, stories unique to the places you live and the people you know. Every day, Monday to Thursday, we'll be joined by a guest host, an avid user of social media who's prepared to share their insights and ideas with us and you. Today, Dean Obeidala joins us in the stream. Welcome, Dean. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here for the kickoff. It's the kickoff. It's a great time to have you here. It's an absolute pleasure. I also want to introduce my co-host, good friend, our digital producer, Ahmed Shihab El Dean. Ahmed is going to be every day looking at what's happening on the web, finding out the most interesting and insightful stories that are creating a buzz in social media. Ahmed, tell the people how they can get into the stream. Sure, Derek should come as no surprise to anybody that you can connect with us on Facebook. Just search for AJ Stream. But I want to draw your particular attention to the Discussions tab, because the entire concept of the show is that we're trying to tap into conversations that are already happening, but also generate some conversations of our own. So feel free to start a new topic um, here on Facebook, or if you prefer Twitter or TweetDeck or Hootsuite, um, you can always connect with us. Just tweet us at AJ Stream. And last, but certain, certainly not least, uh, is our actual beta testing website right here where you could be live streaming the show. Directly beneath it, we have our Feed the Stream box where you can share content via Facebook or Twitter. Ultimately, it's my job to make sure, and it's my responsibility to make sure that your voice gets heard on the show and potentially even seen. If you have something to say, record a video, send us the link, and you could find yourself in the stream. That's great, Ahmed. This is all about interactivity, and we want people to get involved. Dean, before we go any further, tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. Well, I'm performing in an off-Broadway play in New York City, a comedy show called Laughing Liberally, This Ain't No Tea Party. And I was supposed to be in Syria for a big show, but a revolution happened. And as a comic now performs in the Middle East, revolution and protests are part of the reality to deal with. Well, this has got to be a challenge for anybody who's thinking about going to, traveling, doing work in the Middle East right now, because these ideas of revolution are spreading virally, basically. Um, you know, a lot of times students will claim that they forgot their homework. But how about the revolution ate my homework? This is exactly how one Yemeni blogger has described his experience traveling home in the middle of an uprising. Osama al Ariani, and you can see a good image of him here on my uh, page, is a young man who's based in New York, went back home to Yemen to talk about what's been happening. He had a perception that the images that were being depicted in the news were not fully reflective of what he 
thought could be told as far as the story. And we're really, really lucky uh, to have the chance to talk to him. He launched a website called The Revolution Ate My Homework, literally. And we've got Osama El Ariani joining us right now live on Skype. So, Osama, welcome to the stream. It's such a pleasure to have you. Welcome. Thank you. So, so tell us a little bit about, first of all, how did you feel when you saw what was happening in your homeland? Because you left Yemen a number of years ago. Am I right? Yes. Uh, I mean, it started um, in Tunisia and then in Egypt, and it completely occupied my uh, my daily life. I would watch Al Jazeera day and night, and being a photography student, I tried to incorporate that somehow into my photography projects. But there's nothing really like direct engagement. Now, now this is the thing, so that people have a good and clear understanding. When you say you began to incorporate this into your own work. That means that you actually went home. You left the United States and went to Yemen in order to capture these images. Is that correct? Yes, but initially I tried to do it without going home. So I was doing, you know, media appropriation of images, with, mixing it with existing uh, pictures, and it felt just so lame and pathetic. And uh, I felt I really need to be there and produce, you know, my own material and so see for you, myself. You but basically you tried to play it cool, but ultimately you had to get basically in on the action. And it's so interesting because we've been looking at some of the images that you put on your website. And here on my screen, you can see, can you describe us what we're seeing here? Uh, actually, I, it's a young woman who is in a, uh, surrounded by a group of young men, and they're speaking. And you know, this is one of the most interesting issues that's come up in the protests thus far, is the question of if women and men should be participating in protests together. Can you tell us a little bit about what you saw on the ground from a gender perspective? Um, th this woman in the picture is uh, Huda Al-Attas, and she's a well-known uh, writer and novelist, and uh, she's involved in the protest. Uh, and this tent, actually, this is the entrance of the, the media tent where all the journals, journalists are. Um, so my, you know, my idea for the images is not necessarily, you know, newsworthy material, but uh, things that happen on the side that, uh, that interest me. Um, in terms of, of, you know, men and women, you know, they're both represented there. There's a section for, for women uh, at the stage in the public square, in Chain Square. And uh, a few days ago, there was a massive protest uh, carried, carried on by, uh, by women. So they're both in it together. Now, Dean, I know that you were also in the Middle East recently. You were doing yes. some shows in, I think, Saudi Arabia and Doha. Uh, were you in, in, Dubai. in Dubai as well? So you were also on the ground. I mean, it seems like there's this massive feeling of change that is sweeping over young people in particular. What did it feel like being there? Well, I, I was there when the revolution in Egypt was really close, getting close to its peak. And the young people there, everywhere I went across the region, were very excited about it. And I feel there's some connection. I mean, stand-up comedy is new to the region for the last three years. The young people wanted their own voice in their own form of entertainment. I think at the same time, they want their own voice in their form of government now. And they're not taking it for granted anymore. They're like, we want to have an impact, we want to change things, and we think we can. You know, this is something that is so cool, how people feel like they personally can make an impact. And Ahmed, I know you've been finding some resources that people have been leveraging in order to get their word out. Yeah, you know, after Egypt happened, you know, after Mubarak was ousted, a lot of my friends and a lot of young Egyptians started to go back to Egypt. And I think it's interesting that, you know, this gentleman went back before the revolution happened, so to speak. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. but. It's worth mentioning there are all these sites like Crowd Voice right here. Uh, you know, they have a Yemen section, and essentially it's all based around user generated content. I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, Osama, but um, it's essentially the Yemen one is very interesting because I found a video which really highlights the role that women are playing. And it's true, you know, women in Yemen, particularly, but across the Arab world, have been you know, had a marginal role in society, so you know, to speak, for and so before long. We, before we actually go to that video, because that, that's a really compelling one that I want to see, yeah. but I, I wanted to get uh, Osama to give us a little bit more context of what is the feeling like down there, because in reading your blog, one of the things you talk about is this sense of unity, a sense of people coming together. We know that Yemen is currently the poorest nation on the, in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, um, and a lot of people from different parts of the country have wanted different things. There was a separatist movement in the north. There have been people having concerns in the south. And yet it seems that people have been leaving their pre-established uh, their, their pre political positions at home for this common idea of a new Yemen. I mean, is this a, a right way to look at it, or what did you feel on the ground? 
That, that was actually the, the most amazing thing that, that I experienced there in, in Change Square is how you know people that wouldn't normally see other groups of people would, would meet there, would socialize, would make new friends and would you know sleep in the same tent together. So there's a certain culture that emerged in the square that's really fascinating to me. And um, you know, from I, I'm considering going back for for a, a longer period of time just to to be in that in that uh, in that atmosphere. Um, so it's it's really you know people in the south that you know wanted to uh, uh, split the country are now starting to to gather and under the same demands of the whole country, which is to to change the regime and to to stick to unity. And um, it's really very hopeful and very ideal, idealistic time. And Osama, I just want to jump in here just quickly with a tweet that I think also kind of puts this in a perspective. You know, here it says, Yemeni women were carrying photos of Che Guevara in their marches today against mm. Ali Abdullah Saleh. And if I go to this photo that's also we found, I mean, these are men here in this picture, but they were marching alongside the women. And right here, you could see a photo of Che Guevara. Um, I think this is really interesting because it's also important to mention how important people of your generation, you know, the kind of role they're playing. Because I think it's at least 50% of the population is, is what? In it's Yemen? something like 44% of the population right. of Yemen is under the age of 14. And, and this is one thing I, I would ask you, Osama, before we let you go, is so there's a lot of really good feeling right now. But do you think that that is going to be enough to sustain the revolution? Let's say Saleh goes. What happens then? Will people go back to their previous corners? Or do you think there's enough momentum to really make a, a different kind of society? That is the big question. And even though there are some problems that we have to admit uh, within the movement, everyone is, is really hopeful and they want to work together to, to make it work. Uh, we can't really afford to, to fail in this. Um, maybe we didn't choose the timing. Uh, that it happened kind of, you know, after Egypt and Tunisia. But now that it, it's, it started, we really need to make it work and make it successful. Uh, well, that is very, very well said. We didn't choose the timing, but now it's the time to best make it work. Thank you, Osama, so much for joining us. We hope that you'll come back with more images and more stories if you do decide to go back to Yemen. Thank you. Just one note about the Che Guevara picture that you mentioned. Yes. Um, I was just looking in the Boston, uh, Boston big picture, and they had pictures from Yemen and that particular picture. And then in the comments, people were talking, why is Che Guevara there? And someone says, because he's a symbol of anti-Americanism. So this is like a perfect example of how, you know, the same symbols are perceived to be different in other places. Mm. Uh, so the same the same reason that they would carry it here in New York or wherever is the same reason that they're carrying it there. Yeah, it's it's right. a symbol for struggle and, you know, for uh, class struggle and for, you know, changing uh, rigid structures and for justice. So it's, it's really well, all Sam, the same. Let me, let me uh, make sure we understand this because this is a really important point. You're saying that in people in Boston were saying, oh, they're carrying it because it's an anti-American symbol. But you will see cats in Brooklyn and in, in mm -hmm. Bay Area and mm -hmm. people in Austin and around in Chicago wearing Che Guevara symbols as a symbol of revolution and making change. You're saying, Osama, that they too are seeing this as a symbol of making positive change uh, in the same way that we would use the symbol. Potentially. Right. right. That, that's a, a really great point, Osama. And thank you for offering that clarification. Once again, we appreciate having you on, and we hope that you'll come back and join us with more images and, and more dialogue or stories of what's happening on the ground in Yemen. Thank you very much. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Cheers. You know, it's really interesting, the globalization of this idea of change, because right. we can all see ourselves yeah. as people who are seeking freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think that you've got some really compelling imagery of women who are also on that same march for freedom. But, you know, there, there's a, a little bit of a, an interesting angle to that story as well. Yeah, no, definitely. And, uh, you know, I mean, for, for s uh, several days now, you know, the president's been trying to essentially chide women for their role, as we said, you know. They shouldn't be coming out to protest. And in the back of this video here, you see all the men walking here, some of them even creating a barrier. I mean, I know you have a similar video, but you see women here taking really a central role in the Absolutely. revolution, much like in Egypt, much like in other countries. Well, it's amazing because, I mean, in this same image I, I've got in front of my screen, basically now, not only do we see women marching, we see them ringed by children on the left side of the screen, on the right side of the screen. It's the children literally protecting their mothers. And I think that is so powerful. 
Don't forget, we're looking all the time for your take on these same stories. So please keep the tweets coming to at AJStream. Hi, my name is David Cohn. I'm the founder of Spot Us at the URL spot.us, and I'm in the stream. We're going to turn now to India, where an anti-corruption campaign has turned into a social media revolution, which has caused some to question the country's democratic credentials. Joining us to discuss this issue is Jillian York from the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Jillian, welcome to the stream. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. Now, I got to say, just to give a little bit of a lay of the land here, this is a story about a gentleman by the name of Anna Hazare, who is a longtime activist, basically a 72-year-old activist in India. And you can, if you look at my screen, you see this particular image that I thought was so compelling. This is of the man entering a hunger strike. Right. He entered a hunger strike on April 6th to protest against what he felt was significant corruption in India, in Indian government. Well, he captured the imagination of the entire nation, and you see all of these uh, media outlets that are basically trying to cover him, even as he's fasting. Five million tweets later, um, or, or at least it's been up to five million tweets now, but within four days, he'd had an impact on the Indian government. They'd capitulated to his demands. Mm -hmm. Jillian, I would love to get your insights into this, because I know that you're an expert on how people use social media at the intersection of activism. What do you think when you see something like this where one person manages to have such a broad impact on the, the imagination of a society? Sure. I mean, this was, you know, a really fascinating story that I actually hadn't heard about until today um, when, when it was sent to me. And so, you know, and I think that this is a case where, you know, the Internet is really this one place where we can have a truly global uh, commons. And in India, a huge country, um, you know, I think it's hard to have an impact offline in sort of traditional means of activism um, when it's so many people, such a big space. And so uh, the Internet provides a great space. Um, social media in particular provides a great space for people to connect over an issue like this. Well, you know, we had an opportunity to speak via Skype with an Indian journalist, Shoma Chowdhury, and this is what mm -hmm. she had to say. It was a very, very important, and I think even more than important, an unusual moment for uh, Indian public life. Uh, the big thing that he achieved was to really make corruption absolutely the focus of public discourse uh, for a while. It has been a growing anxiety because of the scale of scams that have been exposed in recent time. I won't say that this is unusual, but the media attention on it has been so white hot that there was a growing sense of crisis in the country. And he was able to seize that moment and to ram home the desire for a strong anti-corruption bill at this moment. So I think he was able to catalyze that, you know, in that sense it was important. Why it's unusual is that what should have been a very celebratory moment, you know, for uh, Indian citizens at large, that there was a show of strength against corruption and political corruption, has ended up becoming a very fractured moment in uh, our public life, because both civil society, citizens, the media, everybody is divided on the nature of this bill, the way it was so she's saying that the people are that divided on this bill, and, and that's something that I think is really interesting because basically we think, or at least folks will look at this and say, oh, this is a man who stood up for uh, you know, freedom and democracy. But some people are saying, no, we elected a, a democratic government, and you are now subverting the will of the people because you are causing your issue to be so stark. You know, I'm going to starve myself until you mm -hmm. change. What if people pursue that with every issue? What are you hearing online about? Well, this? you know, I mean, he's definitely, as Jillian said, he's captured the imagination of ordinary Indians, you know, but, but there have been five million tweets since he started the fast. And I think it's worth mentioning, you know, there's a site even on Facebook right here called India Against Corruption, probably spurred by this, that has already, I think it's 200,000, if we just scroll down here, 200,000 people liking it. Um, and the conversations, as you said, people are very divided. You know, someone, for example, right here is tweeting, um, there are two types of people in India now, one, who voice against corruption, and two, the people who essentially are the Indian National Congress. And I think that's interesting because you're seeing a real shift in terms of how people are emotionally responding, but also, you know, for example, right here, Transparency International is now holding the first ever conference against corruption um, you know, in India. And I think that's just showing you, I think, the extent at which a 71-year-old man can have because of tools like social media, but also because of 
using nonviolent protests. Well, I want to get some of your thoughts, actually, Dean, on this issue of corruption on a broader sense, because this is not just happening in India. We're seeing these issues of corruption coming up with young people around the world and, and obviously with older people as well. Uh, if you have a story from your part of the world that you'd like to share with our global audience, tweet us and use the hashtag, hash tell Al Jazeera. I'm Mark Polinsky from Digital Democracy, and I'm in the stream. Let's turn to Mexico, where the drug war has left a lot of people feeling like their government is failing them. And basically, we found this other story that is all around this hashtag called Estado Faido, failed state, where a lot of people are looking at the situation with narco traffic in Mexico as an example of the state potentially collapsing. I mean, we've had something like, you know, 40,000 people killed since the beginning of the war against the drug cartels launched by President Calderon in 2006. So it's not, it was late 2006. It's not even five years. That's over 7,000 people dying a year. We spoke to uh, a blogger, a Mexican blogger, by the name of Jorge Harmodio, and this is what he had to say by Skype. And, and I want to get some of your thoughts on this, Dean, as well as you, Julian. It's like the, the, the state is melting down uh, in an ethical sense, in a moral sense, and in a real uh, in, in some parts of the north, the, the Mexican government is not anymore collecting the taxes. They are the, the crime organizations, the narcotraficants. They are those who collect the taxes. Mexico should be the first country in the world to legalize any kind of drugs and even to legalize the exportation of drugs. So he's making and a very like powerful statement there. He's saying that we should, that Mexico should legalize the sale and distribution of any kind of drugs and even the export of it. Dean, what do you think are the implications of Mexico taking a stance like that? Uh, they have to do something. I mean, I don't know if it's a failed state, but it's a failing state. They have a poverty rate of 44% right now. Last year, they lost 50% of their foreign direct investment. They have the slowest, the greatest contraction in their economy since the Depression. And who, let's be honest, part of their economy is from tourism. Who wants a vacation in Mexico at this point? I mean, <laughs> Afghanistan seems a little bit more attractive. If someone says you want to go to Mexico, like, what do you hate me? Why would you want to go on vacation in Mexico? So, I mean, that's part of the whole thing. If part of your revenue is from tourism, you have to make it a safe, secure environment for the citizens and for tourists to come in. You know, Dean, I want to get in there because you brought up Afghanistan. And, you know, to put this in a global context, and I hope we can get to Jillian really quickly, I just wanted to share with you guys this tweet. It says, U.S. private arms sales in 2009, 30 million to Colombia, 40 million to Afghanistan, there you go, 126 million to Iraq, 131 million to Israel, Saudi Arabia gets 153, and 171 million to Mexico from the U.S. Okay, so Jillian, basically what Ahmed has just read is a statistic that is saying that the private arms sales to Mexico from the U.S. are higher than they are to Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. What does that mean when we see all the arms going into Mexico from the U.S., but the drugs are all coming out of Mexico to the United States? Yeah, I mean, you know, that actually, that statistic really surprises me. I was just going to throw you the, inter the Mexican internet penetration statistic, which is actually like 30%, but, but forget about that for a minute, because, I mean, what you've got here is a situation where, yeah, I mean, I think one of the solutions possibly is, you know, if not in the export, at least, um, you know, sort of changing the way the laws work in terms of uh, uh, drug sales and drug, um, drug use in Mexico. But, could, they, the, I, but could it make a difference if you, let's say you legalize the trade in Mexico, mm -hmm. but we don't do anything in the United States? What does it matter? Because the U.S. is going to continue their interdiction. This is where the market is. Can this be addressed only by Mexico or does this gonna, is this going to require action in America as well? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this ultimately becomes a, a global issue, not just the U.S. and Mexico, but but globally. I mean, yeah, I think I think we absolutely need to be looking at this at that level. It's a third. It's a 13 billion dollar a year industry from Mexico through the drugs. They pay their cops. A, what I read, 100 million dollars in bribes a month. In yeah. some cases, it's a legalizing or not. It's a huge multi-billion dollar business, and it's going to seep its way into America. So legalizing is not going not gonna to make it better for the states. It's going to cause more problems for us, and violence is going to still creep over the border. Well, and it's worth mentioning 90% of cocaine that's in the United States comes from Mexico, and there's 50,000 troops that Calderon has involved in this war. See, well, part of the thing is, I'm like, it seems like this, the, the trade keeps getting bigger and bigger. Now we've made it more violent, so we, violent we've militarized it, and nothing's changing. And there's a basic economic issue here. So long as you've got a significant demand for drugs in the United States, and Mexico is a conduit for supply, that you're going to have people willing to sell it. And the more violence and interdiction, I mean, it seems like the higher the price of the drugs. 
I mean, if a hunger strike could help, I would go on one to help Mexico at this point. But it, yeah. it, it takes much more than that. And you have their anti-drug czar arrested for corruption two years ago. You know, mayors have been killed by police officers in Mexico. It, it's systemic corruption from the top to the bottom, not to the president, but right up there in that administration, all the way through the, the local police officer. It has to take the people together, I guess, working with the support of the United States and the global community to change it. I think you're absolutely right. And I want to thank you, Dean, for coming and joining us and sharing this with us. You're going to be with us for a couple more days, so I'm glad to say that, uh, to know that you'll be with us. Jillian, thank you so much for joining us today, for taking the time out of your day. Appreciate it, and we hope to see you again on the stream. Sure, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I hope you'll take a look around at stream.aljazeera.com. This is our new beta site, and that's where you'll find updates on today's stories and a whole lot more. Remember, make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We're going to need your input to keep this moving. Check us out. Tweet us at AJStream. We'll see you again tomorrow.